One of the things that you may have to do in your virtual environment running NSX is set up some sort of network address translation in the event that you need to translate something from your NSX environment to the internet, potentially, or if you need to allow the NSX capability of allowing traffic from the outside to read something internally. Either way, NAT is basically how you would go about doing that. There's two different types of NAT. Let me go ahead and do a quick little whiteboard session with you guys so that we understand what's what. Go ahead and draw it out like this. So there's two different types, <laughs> excuse me. You have SNAT, which is gonna be basically source NAT. In other words, you're saying anything from inside to outside is gonna be using SNAT. Where if I have the 172.29.1.0 slash 24 subnet, and I need to go out to the internet, I'm going to go ahead and create a SNAT rule that's going to allow that traffic to happen. So inside to outside. If you want internet access on your virtual machines and you are not routing all the way down to your DLR or you have turned routing off on your DL on your ESG, which I'll talk about that here in just a minute, what we've done, then NAT on the Edge Services Gateway is how you would accomplish that. The other one is going to be Destination NAT or DNAT which is going to be destination-based. This is going to be from the outside to the inside. And when you do this, this is going to be a one-to-one -one translation. So if I am going to tie traffic to, say, 10.10.0.2, and I want it to be translated over to 172.29.1.14, for example, that would be how I would do that. And then you can specify TCP, UDP, or some other type of transport that you need to be able to access the traffic with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up SNAT for the 172.29.1 subnet to give a couple of VMs the ability to reach the internet through NAT. And then I'm going to set up DNAT to allow from the outside into my virtual environment so what we're basically going to go ahead and do is I'm going to go take a look at a couple of my devices. Here I have this Windows VM here. And I was doing a little bit of testing before we started. But you can see right here I have no internet access, right? If I come up here and I do a ping to Google, obviously it's not working. It failed. And But if I do an IP config, this guy's getting DHCP. So I have a 172.29.1.ip. And if I do a forward slash all, I can see that my web address or my DNS server is, uh, let me go ahead and mark, it is quad eight, right? So we know that that's situated. If I also was to pull up this Linux VM and log into him, give that a second to connect. Let me go ahead and minimize Firefox and close Firefox and pull up the terminal. If I was to try to ping Google, we're not going to see anything show up, right? It's going to, the ping will fail. Actually, the cool, th the, the drawback to Linux is it won't actually show you that it's failing. It'll just not respond. So I'm going to go ahead and just hit control C to stop the ping. So the first thing I'm going to do is do the source NAT. So I'll go ahead and bring this back up here. I'm going to go to the ESG underneath the NAT. I'm going to add a rule for source NAT, for a SNAT rule. And I'm going to apply this on the uplink. So this is going to be the connection from the Edge Services Gateway upstream to the CSR 1000V. The protocol is going to be any protocol. So basically a permit IP any any, essentially. And I'm going to say the source range is going to be 172.29.1.0 slash 24. Destination range, there isn't going to be anybody, but I'm going to give it a translated source IP of 10.10.0.2. I'm going to go ahead and click on Add, and then I'm going to publish that. Give that a couple seconds, and now that is working. Now what I'll be able to do is you have a couple different outputs that you can look at. You can come in here and do a show NAT maps, right, and we have some NAT maps that are going out. I'm going to hit the up arrow, and if I want to look at specifically the SNAT table, I can hit the enter key and look at specifically that. What I'm going to go ahead and do 
is I'm going to come back over here to my Windows PC and after a small period of time we should have internet reachability. You can see that we have still have the little triangle thing going on down here but if I was to try to ping Google again the ping is going out and I automatically get internet access when that pops off which is doing what I want it to do. If I pull up my and let's go back over here and hit the up arrow you're going to see that there's a lot more connectivity going out. So I have some UDP 53 going out for DNS going out in order to get the connectivity operational. I have some ICMP that's going out as well. So I know that that's working. If I come over here to my Linux box and I hit the up arrow and go to pinggoogle.com, my pings for Google are working, which tells me everything is operational at that perspective. So that means if I come back over here, I have a bunch of additional connections going out, which is what I want to see. Now, on the flip side of that, if I want to allow internet access, if I go back over to my Windows box and I hit the up arrow a couple times, we go into here and hit the up arrow and go netstat-nao. One of the things that you'll see right here is on TCP, go ahead and mark this for, you'll notice this right here. This entry right here is telling me that for TCP connections going to port 80, depending on what the local address is, is any uh, any IP address, and the foreign address is all zeros. This colon colon here simply means that it's listening for anything. Same thing right here. So this would be your basic uh, basically IPv6. This right here would be IPv4, essentially. So that's where that would come into play. So what I'm going to go do is I am going to create a destination NAT rule that will allow me to connect from the outside in to my server. I'm going to come back over here to this guy. I'm going to add a destination NAT rule. And I'm going to say the applied on the uplink. The protocol will be TCP. So I'll have to scroll down a little bit to find TCP. TCP is right there. And then the source range is going to be any. I'm basically going to say, I don't care what the source port range is and things like that. Now, the original destination port, this is going to be the IP address that you're going to point traffic to. So this will be your 10.10.0.2 address. The original destination port range will be 80, meaning if I get traffic pointed to 10.10.0.2 colon 80, I am going to translate that to 172.29.1.14 on port 80. So this is how the NAT mapping comes into play. I'm going to click on Add. I'm going to go to Publish. That'll take a couple seconds to do its thing. I'm going to hit the up arrow. I'm going to swap this out for DNAT. And we can see that we have that translation in place. So now what I'm going to go do is I am going to open up a web page here. This is just coming from my computer here. I'm going to type in 10.10.0.2, hit the enter key, and voila, there it is. I'm going to hit the up arrow, and we can see the incoming connection to this guy. If I go back to Windows and I hit the NAO, hit the up arrow, we're going to see that there's an established connection here in the IPv4 range. I have these connections coming open, and that is how you do destination-based NAT. And that's pretty much it. Now, with that being said, and not a whole lot going on besides that. Obviously, there might be the potential for you to want to do some sort of firewalling and lock that down because there's really no firewall features turned on here. So on the edge firewall, when we get to that point, we would probably want to have edge firewall capabilities turned on for this. So I'm going to keep the NAT rules in place. I'm actually going to add another rule. It's going to be a source NAT. And the source NAT... And I'm going to go ahead and specify on the uplink, but it's going to be 172.29.2.0 slash 24. And it's going to get mapped over to 10.10.0.2. Click on add. And we're going to publish that. And this is going to be for any of my other VMs that are running. So if I go back to hosts and clusters and I go to VLVM3, which is going to be a different subnet, I'm going to go ahead and power this guy on. And as soon as he comes online, he should have internet access as well. Now, because I'm at the end of the video, what I'm also going to be doing is testing out some load balancing capabilities as you move forward. So I'm actually going to come to this Windows PC here. Let me go to Windows VM. I'm actually going to power him down. 
Let me go over here, power, and then shut down. I'm going to basically create a, I'm gonna convert this VM to a template. So I can deploy one, uh, two of these guys. I'm gonna deploy two of them, and this is going to allow me to do things like load balancing and things like that. So once we get this squared away, I'm gonna actually convert this guy to a template and we'll be able to deploy a couple of them. I'll pause obviously between here and then, but or different video I should say. So that's basically where that comes into play. So he's shutting down. If we come back over here to this guy and we do a refresh, we can see that host three is, or the, I should say LVM three is gonna be coming online. On the compute cluster, we can see that from a summary perspective, I actually bumped the RAM up on all three hosts to 12 gigs of RAM. As a side note, in case anybody was wondering about that. And then if we come back over here to the edge services gateway, networking and security, and we look at the edge services gateway, and I come to routing, and I come down to redistribution, I turn redistribution off. I had OSPF to BGP and BGP to OSPF redistribution happening, but I turned that off so that I would have to rely on NAT in order to get me where I was going. If you're curious to see how that looked, go check out the BGP connectivity that we did where we had OSPF between their edge services gateway and the CSR 1000V, and then we had BGP running between the ESG and the DLR, and we did mutual OSPF to BGP and BGP to OSPF redistribution on the edge services gateway to allow that connectivity. So this guy should be down, which he is. I'm gonna go ahead and close him out. I'm gonna go back over here to hosting clusters. I'm gonna right click on this guy, and on the template option down here, template, convert to template, Yes, it's gonna to convert to template, and then I'm going to deploy two additional VMs. I'm gonna go over here to host to VMs and templates. I'm gonna right click here, and I'm gonna rename this guy to be Windows template. Like that, and click on okay, so that it's obvious to what it is. I'm gonna click on him, and I'm going to right click new VM from this template. We're gonna call this WinVM dash VM one. We're going to put it anywhere that there's capacity. We're going to keep it where it was originally deployed, and we're just going to power on this virtual machine after creation. Finish. This will take some time, so we're going to get a new VM deployed from it. This will get deployed, and this will allow us to test things out like our load balancing capabilities, which we'll get into in an upcoming section, as well as doing the distributed firewall and things like that. I wanna thank you guys for stopping by and hanging out with me in this video, and until next time, guys, take it easy.